So I've spent almost the last two decades working on what some would call the dark side as a technology venture capital investor. Why was I drawn to the dark side? Because I love working with entrepreneurs and supporting them along their journeys as they work to, to create uh, their visions and turn them into reality. I've been fortunate to have had front row seats to the amazing innovative power of entrepreneurs to transform industries and transform lives. I joined the venture capital industry back in 1997, just as the internet was getting started. And one of the first companies that we invested in was at a company called Unwired Planet. Unwired Planet was the first company to put an internet browser on a mobile phone. And they drove a wave of innovation around access to data from mobile devices that changed the lives of billions of people around the world and has created an important platform for creating social impact today. I was first exposed to the idea of combining this investment approach with philanthropic goals in 2009 when I, transfer, when I traveled to Zambia with an organization called Spark Ventures. Spark was taking um, an investment approach to philanthropy, identifying entrepreneurial NGOs in the developing world that were serving children and investing in businesses that could drive financial sustainability for those partners. So this idea of harnessing the power of business and entrepreneurship to create social impact was a really, really powerful idea, and I was hooked. So I got involved in starting an early stage impact fund called Impact Engine, which identifies promising entrepreneurs that are launching for-profit businesses where there's positive social or environmental impact baked into their product so that impact grows hand in hand with revenues. One of those promising entrepreneurs is Brian Hill. When I was growing up, my father taught in Folsom Prison in California, and I remember at night he would actually read, he'd bring home the essays of inmates and he'd read them to us, almost like bedtime stories. And feeling of the hopes and dreams, it was, it was disheartening to recognize that many of these, that so few of the people had actually the opportunity to even get into the classroom, and many of those dreams would never be realized because they didn't have the resources to make that a reality uh, post-release. At that age, though, I had no idea of the magnitude of the problem. 12 million Americans cycle through our jails each year, and we spend $74 billion incarcerating that population. Now, what do we get as a return on that investment? Sadly, we see about 50% return a short time after being released, a rate we call recidivism. But what is driving such abysmal returns? How, how are we spending the time of this literally captive audience? Right now, we're showing daytime television. Jerry Springer, The Price is Right. This is not a formula for success, especially when we know it works. It's been unequivocally proven that education and vocation, when provided to the MA population, decreases recidivism by about 43%, even when you're controlling for things like background and motivation. And yet, with, and, and yet it's politically challenging, and it's operationally very difficult to, to get people into the classroom. And this is where Adobo comes in. At Adobo, or Jail Education Solutions, we bring tablet technology and secure wireless networks into jails and prisons across the country. That enable them to access everything from literacy all the way to college degrees, treatment programming, substance abuse, parenting courses. Not only can they begin making progress while they're incarcerated, but they can continue that progress post-release. Now, it hasn't been easy to bring technology like this into a very secure environment, uh, but we've seen a lot of growth already, and by the end of the year, we hope to be here in about five jails here in California. So there are a lot of challenges facing entrepreneurs, but one of the first challenges that they face is raising the funding so that they can take their idea and turn it into a product that they can take out to market and start to test. Now, most entrepreneurs raise their first money from friends and family, but impact entrepreneurs, who often come from the populations and communities that they're trying to serve, generally don't have that rich uncle or connections to the entrepreneur in the tech space that just cashed out and is investing in the next generation of startups. This is where philanthropy can play an important role as risk capital. So you can imagine my dad as a, as a teacher and a father of six, not exactly the rich uncle you're looking for. So we had to find and adopt our friends and family, and that came through philanthropy. Philanthropic capital is critical at the early stages of an impact company, and it's more than just the, the capital itself, the money itself. When you look at sort of bottom of the pyramid or challenge population businesses, there is fundamentally a high level of risk and a, and a, cap, a much more capital intensive expenditure on getting prototypes out there, testing it in the market because of location or the challenge of, of the, the, the barriers of, of entry that, that take place in those markets. 
Um, it's because of this, it creates a lot more risk, and that risk scares away investors. Um, and, and it's a little too early to, to bring in that capital. And so philanthropic dollars, if you look at the narratives of the successful social enterprises here, in, it, here at SOCAP, you'll see that the narratives almost always begin with that philanthropic capital. We were fortunate enough to have the MacArthur Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust come in and give us equity-free financing, grant money in the early stages, as well as win money through some awards. They allowed us to go and prototype tablet technology behind uh, wires, behind the, the wires, we call it. And you can imagine, again, how challenging that is to bring the secure, the secure technology into a very tight correctional facility. Now, in this early stage, when you look at that philanthropic capital that I mentioned, it's more than just the money. Yes, it allowed us to prototype and iterate, but what it also allowed us to do was send a strong signal that that a foundation, an organization, an organization that vets companies just like ours and organizations just like ours recognized that we were driving impact. And not only that, but they also helped us anchor our focus in the mission that we were trying to drive. So at Impact Engine, we're looking for action-oriented entrepreneurs that have collected some of the early proof points around the product, both the financial value as well as the impact. And so the fact that MacArthur Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust had backed Brian as an entrepreneur was an important signal to us that he was onto something really important. They're the experts in what drive recidivism, we're not, so it had a really important signaling effect for us. Now our goals with Adovo were to help the company get to that next level of proof point around the business, establish the product market fit, um, secure some of those early customers, put together a revenue model that worked and could scale. And this is where impact-motivated financial investors can make a big difference. It wasn't until we really actually raised the money uh, through Impact Engine and when we went out to raise our first round of capital that we recognized the, the importance of, of having a business model that was credible and scalable. If we're going to make an impact in this space, you have to have those components. We had raised money from the philanthropic end of things, but there were very few financial requirements or business rigor that went behind that. It was really just driving it to social outcomes. Um, that business rigor came through Impact Engine. It came through, it, it, sort of again, that realization came as we went out to raise money. Now, the, the rigor that, as we, as we look at that, that we wanted to make sure that we did have that, we still had that balance. Um, because you almost want this, uh, this sort of tension that exists, this healthy tension that exists between profitability and outcome. And so we specifically went out and raised PRI investment, program-related investment from uh, philanthropic dollars as well. This is where philanth philanthropy can even play in the, in the growth stage and take uh, and be a part of that upside as well. And so we looked at the balance. We wanted to make sure that when we send out in investor updates that we have investors and stakeholders that aren't, aren't just looking at the financial outcomes but are also looking at our impact metrics as well. So commingling impact-focused philanthropic dollars with investment dollars is really, really valuable as a company is proving out its business model and proving out its impact. But when a company gets to the growth stage, that's where the paths can diverge. So some companies will have demonstrated their appeal to financial investors, and they can raise funding from more traditional sources. These companies might be the next Tesla or the next Etsy. Other companies will be operating at break even, but not necessarily driving the kind of, of profits or growth that financial ex investors get excited about. And this is where philanthropy can play a role as growth capital, helping those companies grow their business and grow their impact. As we look at our company, we see definitely venture funding is, is a, has been a strong option for us because we have a scalable model that will reach a large percentage of the population. But as we as, as we look at, again, the different models of, of the different companies that come out of this, we really have to recognize that a big wave of, of social entrepreneurship and impact companies are coming that are looking towards exit and liquidity. That's a conversation that starts from the early days of, of your, with your conversations with investors all the way to as you start looking towards those actual opportunities. And this is a challenge. Liquidity is important for two reasons. One, we want to be able to free up these entrepreneurs to go fight the next battles, to go start the next thing. There's a, there are a lot of problems that we need to solve, and we need sharp entrepreneurs to go and so help continue to solve those problems. The second thing is we need liquidity for impact capital. That needs to also be recycled. And the best part about recycled impact capital is it comes with many lessons learned. And so having that, creating those liquidity events or those exits are something that we need to not just be thinking about and talking about, we actually need to be taking action on. Uh, two, ways that, two suggestions as we look towards exits uh, might be, and, and where philanthropic capital can really come into play, is something where when you see a sustainable model, but not necessarily one that requires venture growth, doing something like a nonprofit buyout, actually buying out the company, converting it to a nonprofit, and allowing that sustainable revenue to continue in the nonprofit 
se setting. So you're not as focused on profit, but can just focus on the mission and the outcome. Another option, as we look at sort of venture stage companies, might be um, an impact public offering, pooling together philanthropic capital so that we actually have an, a liquidity event that, that many people and syndicates can play into. Um, looking at these different options, as, as we again look at the, the ways in which philanthropic capital can step into the market, you have number one, you have your early seed stage, uh, early seed stage capital. That is critical and that is a must where philanthropy must play. The second is in the growth stage. Using public uh, program related investment, PRI dollars is a great way to take on the upside. And the third area, which we need to not only be thinking about but addressing, is how do we create liquidity? How can philanthropy play to create liquidity? And think about not only the two recommendations I made, but other options. Because if we're going to have scale and we want to continue to maintain the impact in the space and create liquidity events that drive mission just as strongly as they drive um, revenue and pro profitability, then we're going to need to have philanthropy come into the space again. Investors have an important role to play as well both as risk capital, but also setting high expectations for the performance of the business from a financial perspective, and also helping entrepreneurs reach those milestones that show that they have a business model that works, that can scale, and setting the stage for growth. If you look at modern history, it's really entrepreneurs that have driven innovation and driven value creation, from Carnegie to Gates to Zuckerberg. There's a new generation of entrepreneurs that's building social and environmental impact into their businesses from day one. A lot of them are at this conference. A lot of them are sitting here in this room. So I'll leave you with a question. What are you going to do to help these entrepreneurs turn their vision into reality? Thank you. Thank you.